Hello, this is Vlad and welcome to the interview of Crypto Insider. Today I'm going to be talking with Giacomo Zucco, who is a well-known Bitcoin maximalist and one, one of the few people who embraced the label of being a maximalist despite all the bad meanings that it might have. And that's something that we'll be discussing today. So hello, Giacomo. Hi, everybody. We're not so few. I mean, there is a lot of people that, uh, that is uh, self-labeling maximalist, but yeah. It seems to be like a derogatory term on Twitter. And some people appropriate the idea and say, you know, I'm also a maximalist, but at the same time, I also believe in Monero or in <laughs> Litecoin or whatever. And I remember yeah. watching the last episode of Magical Crypto Friends, which is with Charlie Lee and Fluffy Pony and Whale Panda and Samson Mao. And at some point they all said, you know, we are actually Bitcoin maximalists in the sense that we want Bitcoin to succeed and we want it to be the best coin, but we don't want it to be the only one or not necessarily. So do you think that there are, there are layers to being a maximalist? Uh, there certainly are because uh, the term itself was created in a, derog a pejorative form uh, and derogatory form from Vitaly Buterin and others uh, in order to represent this approach as basically wrong. So it was uh, some kind of, uh, like uh, it was a blockchain slur and uh, some of us adopted that uh, in order to uh, to def defuse the rhetorical the rhetorical uh, uh, the rhetorical attempt and so right now everybody's uh, using the term in different ways i tried in riga to give a presentation about a very very uh, scary strict uh, definition of maximalism with a lot of uh, uh, bad connotation in order to to try to prove that even that very very scary cult-like definition of maximalism is actually very very close to what a, a couch's uh, approach uh, will be to to this whole uh, ecosystem so yeah th there are like fluffy pony and and charlie lee they are they are people uh, who are contributing somehow to bitcoin so in a way i would say they are definitely bitcoiners uh, i tend to use uh, the term maximalism in order to imply that i really do not think that altcoins can succeed in general so while i'm not sure that bitcoin will succeed i'm kind of sure i mean as sure as i am of other things uh, like uh, i'm sure that uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the small private internet that you, you create in your garage is not going to take uh, over the internet uh, very, very mm -hmm. soon. In the same way, I'm kind of sure that altcoins cannot uh, be sustainable and cannot uh, deliver what they promise. While uh, Bitcoin could very well fail itself. So right now, I am, from a descriptive point of view, I am like a fiat money maximalist, meaning that I recognize that right now, US dollar is the, uh, the, the money, unfortunately, is the kind of money people is using. It sucks because it's uh, uh, manipulated, inflated, uh, uh, difficult to transmit over the internet without uh, third parties, and the third parties can censor you, they can spy on you, they can track you, they can enforce KYC, uh, AML mafias. So. Uh, it's a bad situation, but that's the descriptive reality. Bitcoin could maybe overthrow that. I hope that it will. Uh, and I think that there are very, very good chances it will. Uh, while altcoins, by definition, I think they cannot succeed. I remember that last week I had an interview with Jimmy Song, and he had that controversial statement that it's a good idea to spend with your credit card and then pay with the Bitcoin that you have? And do you think that it, up to this point, it's a better idea to actually use fiat for your purchases and save your Bitcoin just for emergency spendings? Yeah, I completely agree. Actually, in the presentation, in the presentation of Riga about maximalism, I included also this part. So I, I argued that these points, of course, in a satirical kind of sarcastic way, but also seriously in a way, uh, with some nuances. I argued first uh, the, my position about altcoins. Altcoins cannot succeed. Basically, altcoins are scam uh, in, a, in a very uh, loose definition of the term for some, in a very strict definition for some others. Uh, the second point was that any 
uh, important change to the base the, to the base rules of Bitcoin is also something that we, we should reject and we should uh, uh, we should basically not accept. And the third point was about spending. Uh, I the, the simplified triggering version of what I said is that uh, pushing people to spend Bitcoin is a scam. The nuanced, uh, uh, the detailed version would be that uh, if we think Bitcoin can be a better form of money during the process of uh, uh, monetization of Bitcoin, in which Bitcoin chooses to just be a digital collectible and start to become a, a store of value and then a minimum of exchange, and then eventually maybe even a unit of account, so it becomes really money. In this phase, uh, it's uh, reasonable to expect an appreciation uh, of Bitcoin compared to uh, fiat money. And even if Bitcoin doesn't ap appreciate, with, which is something he, it has to do if it's going to succeed, uh, fiat money is by definition always depreciating uh, as far as uh, purchasing power is concerned. So fiat money is always the base inflated and, uh, and depreciated over time. So if you have two kinds of money, both kind of accepted, uh, let's assume first that you have two kinds of money accepted at the same rate in the market around you. And one money is going to be depreciated over time and the other money is instead some money, it cannot be arbitrarily inflated, it's very res uh, resistant to production. So you have hard money and easy money and the market around you accept uh, both at the same rate. Which one you should spend first? Of course, the easy money first. That's called uh, uh, Gresham Law, but Gresham Law is actually referred more specifically to uh, legal tender uh, and denominations. But uh, we could call it maybe Tears Law, which is more proper. Uh, Tears Law says that uh, the good money uh, in store of value terms uh, dr drives off the bad money. While uh, Gresham Law, uh, simplified, says that the bad money in uh, everyday purchases drives out the good money, which is instead hoarded and hoodled and, and stored. So uh, I agree with what Jimmy said, maybe triggering because we spent a lot of time in the early Bitcoin um, narrative about uh, uh, we should uh, uh, always use Bitcoin in the sense of spend Bitcoin and we should uh, hope for merchant adoption. But actually that will kind of all fake. Every time we, we celebrated the merchant adoption of Bitcoin, we were actually celebrating some, some guy uh, joining BitPay in order to receive Bitcoin from, from odlers, from people believing in Bitcoin, and immediately sell Bitcoin at market price on the open market, actually de uh, depressing the price. Uh, it's not real adoption. While using Bitcoin to store, uh, using Bitcoin to store your wealth, that's adoption. That's an actual use of Bitcoin. So uh, I was saying before, assuming that the market is, is, is accepting both forms of money, the, 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 the shitty devaluated the money and the hard money, you should spend the first, uh, the, the, the former first. But we are not even in that situation. We are in a situation in which the market usually do not even accept the hard money. So we have a strong hard money, which is not even very widely accepted, and fiat money, which is accepted everywhere, basically, and it sucks uh, by definition in, order in, 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 uh, in, in storing wealth. So the, it, it, it's a no-brainer. You should spend first uh, the, 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 the shitty kind of money, which is depreciated, and which everybody already accepts. Of course, there are some caveats here if we want to be super pedantic. If you only receive Bitcoin, if you are one of the lucky dudes that, uh, that manage to be completely uh, uh, unbanked, post-bank, and you receive your wage in Bitcoin only, and you have 100% of your wealth in Bitcoin only, in, in that situation, you will spend Bitcoin. Or if you want to, to, to spend in one of those use cases that require, by definition, Bitcoin, because uh, uh, fiat money systems will not will not let you spend money that way. For example, you want to donate to Wikileaks and you cannot use credit card. You want to buy recreative substances on the Silk Road, which are uh, maybe legal in some country, but illegal in some other country. You cannot use credit cards on PayPal or Apple Pay, uh, Apple Pay for that. So in that case, you spend Bitcoin because you don't have anything else to spend 
or because the specific purchase cannot be uh, performed using fiat money. And that's all the, the point of Bitcoin in the first place. So uh, the, I think that the general statement by Jimmy uh, is, is absolutely correct. I don't know why it triggers so much people. I mean, I know why, because we accepted the narrative that using Bitcoin is spending, while using money sometimes is, uh, uh, is about spending, but sometimes is about storing. And uh, we accepted the narrative that uh, people accepting Bitcoin with payment processor dumping on the market is a good thing, while it isn't. And we accepted the, and we forgot the points of tiers law then uh, that, that says that you spend the shitty money first and the good money after. So you're basically saying that you should be spending your Bitcoin cash? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I did. I, um, uh, I, I did uh, I took a while to split uh, my Bitcoin cash uh, from my actual Bitcoin UTXO. Uh, so to split, it's, a, it's an ugly term. I, I, I took a while to claim my uh, Bitcoin cash airdrop from uh, using my Bitcoin UTXO, uh, but because of privacy concerns and security concerns, many people gave up their privacy um, completely with these airdrops. For example, consolidating all the, their UTXO set into one, uh, maybe uh, address of an exchange with name and surname and KYC identity. So many people uh, did terrible things for, for their privacy with these airdrops. Uh, I took a while to, to collect it, but when I did, uh, I spent it in order to buy Bitcoin, uh, first thing. Uh, so yes, uh, if you have uh, Bitcoin Cash or Bcash, uh, you should use that way before Bitcoin. I completely agree. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you to comment on another comment which I read on Twitter because you know it's the most active place where people debate ideas which are not always maybe profound or meaningful in any way. But I think Jackson Palmer has at some point said that if you have the term maximalist in your description on Twitter, then you should replace it with close-minded. <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, that, that's actually completely nonsense. I mean, the, the term maximalist was, uh, was created in order to represent uh, people using basic logic and common sense about Bitcoin and altcoins as some, some kind of close-minded, uh, cultish, uh, uh, intolerant uh, uh, sect. So that was the original design of the word. And we self-ironically adopted the word. And right now people using the, the, using the term Bitcoin maximalist in the description are mostly just signaling that they are using some kind of healthy skepticism and they, uh, they, they want extraordinary proofs in order to sustain extraordinary claims. Uh, Bitcoin itself was an extraordinary claim and many people uh, required a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, explaining in order to accept that there was something uh, possibly uh, capable of overthrowing the, the fiat money system worldwide. So that was a very extraordinary claim where we, we are still uh, we still should uh, adopt this claim to a certain degree because uh, nothing is uh, nothing is certain. Bitcoin could still fail, uh, but uh, if you adopt a rational mindset and uh, and if you adopt uh, uh, any kind of healthy skepticism, uh, then you know that the default approach should be that something uh, extraordinary usually dot, and too good to be true is usually too good to be true. So having a, a thousands of different coins, uh, each one um, serving the market as money uh, is an inconsistent uh, scenario because uh, one point of money is that it is the most saleable good on the market. And the most saleable, saleable good is one. And uh, in every kind of local market that you can imagine, there is one form of money that uh, usually gets to include uh, the, gets to represent uh, the, the, the best money and the usually cannibalizes the others. Uh, sometimes you don't see that because you have uh, external interferences, like for example, nation states, they, uh, they, they uh, monopolize uh, uh, money and they impose uh, political money with legal tender. So uh, you can see 
uh, I mean, you could see one form of money in the, uh, in the old times, which was the gold standard, gold. Uh, now you can see different forms of money, but that's because of political imposition of different nation states. But if you go to the free market, uh, so if you also go to the black markets of many nation states, for example, Venezuela or Cuba or the, United, uh, or the Soviet Union before the Berlin Wall crashed down, do, then you could find the uh, only one basically strong uh, currency that was the US dollar uh, being actually used instead of the uh, uh, depreciated uh, alternative. So maximalism in this regard is just being realistic and uh, expecting uh, uh, economical, um, economical uh, typical behaviors to still be in place and do not expect extraordinary suspensions of laws of logic and, um, economy, and economy. Also, there is also a point about uh, skepticism about technological revolutions. Like there is a very good essay by Andrew Polstra about Alcoin. He published it like, uh, I think three years ago, and it was describing all the subtle, very small mistakes than people uh, creating the first altcoins did because creating a new crypto system is not easy uh, and it's a kind of a miracle that we have one that actually works and miracles they tend not to replicate very very often so uh, i completely disagree with that statement uh, if you don't want to use the label maximalism because uh, you don't want to uh, to uh, basically concede this kind of uh, 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 this kind of negative uh, depiction, then don't use that term. But uh, people using that term to, descri to describe themselves are mostly just signaling that they are uh, logical and reasonable. Okay, so I will ask you one last question, which revolves around commenting on somebody else's comments. But I saw that Roger Veer was very critical of your PowerPoint presentation and he precisely picked that slide, which was the most controversial about it. And it, I think it was the one in which you said that Bitcoin is the only legit cryptocurrency. Everything else is a scam. Don't trust anyone who tells you to sell your Bitcoin. Don't trade your Bitcoin, just hold it. And how did you feel when that went viral on Twitter? Uh, actually, not very happy because the, uh, the narrative in my presentation was uh, uh, studied, I would say. It's probably, an, uh, probably overstating because I created that the night before as, as kind of always. But uh, I was thinking at the presentation that I was going to give and I was, uh, uh, there was a path in my mind. Like uh, I will describe why, why I'm going to talk about uh, Bitcoin maximalism. I will put here... Uh, the, the most possible triggering and scary and, uh, and the counterintuitive uh, uh, set of uh, maximalist rules in order to trigger you, uh, people of the audience, uh, which, by the way, were people inside the, the conference of, of Baltic on Badger. So they were all already Bitcoin maximalists. So it was some kind of inside joke. So I want to represent what we all believe in the most possibly uh, triggering um, kind of way and then I will explain some uh, logical uh, assumption and I will show you that the, uh, the consequences of these logical assumptions if they are not the uh, triggering sentences that are wrote down they are anyway is, uh, uh, counterintuitively paradoxically very very similar to these uh, uh, general uh, prima facie heuristics uh, the rules in the slide were basically everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. Of course, uh, so let's start with the title of the slide. The title of the slide were the four, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, the five universal truths about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the four, sorry, universal truths about Bitcoin, which is itself mocking the Buddhist uh, uh, four universal truths. So uh, the title itself was already an attempt to, uh, so, to self-irony in order to present that as a religious thing. Uh, you will not call something the four universal truth if, if, if it was not already some kind of, uh, somehow sarcastic. The first one was everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. Of course, that cannot be taken literally. 
um, uh, I mean, Linux is not Bitcoin is, and it isn't in a scam. Git is not Bitcoin, it isn't in a scam. BitTorrent is not Bitcoin. Uh, gold, physical gold is not Bitcoin, it isn't a scam. My car, which uh, even if it's not a Lambo, it, it, it's working very well, it's not a scam. So it's not literally everything, but everything which pretend to be something like Bitcoin or something like the, the next Bitcoin using Bitcoin technology in improper ways in order to replicate the same kind of effect uh, enriching the creators is uh, prima facie as a general heuristic, a scam until proven otherwise. That will be the nuanced definition. Of course, the simple definition is everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one was uh, yeah, every attempt to change Bitcoin is a scam. Of course, neither these can be taken literally like segregated witness or p 2 Sage, uh, maybe next, uh, uh, next on Schnorr or uh, Siga Schnorr input. They are changes to Bitcoin. But even when you implement the light network, even if you are not changing Bitcoin layer one, you are changing Bitcoin as a global, uh, si as a global experience, as a global set of protocols. So of course we will change Bitcoin as a general experience uh, for, for all the times being, and we will probably even change some more the, uh, the base consensus with, uh, I hope, very, very few and very, very slow last modification before reaching stability. Uh, so the, the, the scope, the, 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 the goal of that second sentence was, you should think that every attempt at modifying Bitcoin is itself problematic and potentially dangerous and potentially an attack vector. And so we, we should also, uh, always uh, prefer uh, and protect status quo over any change until we, we get proven that the change is necessary and uh, un, uh, uncontentious and uh, safe to deploy and, and tested and so on and so on. So that your mindset should be uh, until proven otherwise, every attempt to fundamentally change the uh, Bitcoin is something wrong. Even because if Bitcoin can change too much, the sound money characteristic is, uh, has gone because if you can uh, change the total supply, uh, you don't have harmony anymore. If you can change, uh, maybe uh, enforce blacklist or whitelist or KYC, the permissionless uh, side of Bitcoin has gone. So there are some changes that will destroy Bitcoin's value proposition co uh, completely. Then there was a third truth that was the one that we discussed before about Jimmy Song's uh, um, triggering tweet, which is uh, everybody who is trying to push you to spend Bitcoin uh, uh, is scamming you. Uh, there was a very good article by, uh, by Michael Goldstein uh, called uh, uh, everybody, or sorry, by uh, Pierre, I guess. Um, uh, ev or, no, it was Michael. Everybody, uh, everyone is a scammer. Uh, everyone is a scammer is a very good article on the Nakamoto Institute about the fact that uh, when you have something like Harmony, everybody wants you to spend and they want to hold. So uh, it's, it's uh, a normal thing to try to trick others into spending a very valuable asset. Uh, and of course, that's a user scam, which is a, or the worst scam, which is a little bit uh, uh, loose and improper. And the last, uh, the last truth was, we should not be nice with scammers. Uh, even these cannot be taken literally. I mean, I'm personally kind of nice with people that I consider doing very, very scammy things. Like when I, when I meet uh, uh, Zuko Wilcox on a, in a conference, he's a very nice guy and I, I, I tend to be nice with him, but I think that Zcash is very, very unethical on different points of view. And it's very scammy in a way that in the way it has been promoted uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, so uh, that's not literally either, but what I tried to convey with the last sentence was that we should, uh, we should append uh, some social cost into uh, social attacks on Bitcoin, because otherwise social attacks on Bitcoin, they, they carry zero technical cost. So there should be some kind of social protocol that makes uh, uh, expensive for, uh, for the attacker to try to uh, to, to manipulate or distort or corrupt uh, Bitcoin somehow. And uh, especially because, uh, I mean, sometimes people think that if I call something a scam, it means that I want uh, the, the government to, to step in uh, banning that thing. 
uh, it's the other way around. Uh, it's because, it's precisely because we don't want the government to, 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 to step in uh, howsoever, that we need to create a self-regulating culture and attitude in which uh, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we, imp we enforce a very, very strict set of, uh, uh, of uh, rules and we uh, keep ourselves to very, very high standard of ethics and technical precision and we basically bash and mock and ridicule uh, most of the uh, uh, scammy marketing, which is uh, so common in other sectors. So in any sector which is not Bitcoin, I, I don't care very much if some marketing advertising is pushing some false narrative. But in Bitcoin, it's very, very important, it's more important to bash and mock and expose and debunk fake narratives be, uh, exactly because we don't want a regulator, we don't want... Uh, Cons consumer protection, uh, we don't want uh, any kind of uh, uh, legal restriction of liability. Uh, so the, the last sentence was basically, in the cypherpunk crypto anarchist model, uh, you don't want the state to regulate stuff, but you do want people calling out lies uh, or misconception or, uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, dishonest marketing. Uh, so. Uh, to answer, uh, I spoke a lot. Your question was very simple. How did I feel about uh, that, uh, that slide? Uh, that slide was not intended to, be, uh, to, to go viral on Twitter uh, as it was a completely serious slide. That said, I think it was, I mean, it's okay like this. It was like a filter. People incapable on understanding uh, the, the, or people incapable un of uh, looking for the context of the slide and incapable to understand the irony of the title itself, and incapable to understand that uh, these sentences, even if clearly exaggerated and hyperbolic, they are actually very, very close to a good prima facie heuristic in order to navigate this world. Uh, they are basically uh, filtering themselves out from the conversation. So uh, if, you, if you feel so much triggered by that uh, slide, uh, it's a good signal for me that I should not probably engage with you in conversation. So it's a time-saving uh, anti-spam mechanism. So thank you, Roger. I am okay with that. <laughs> that that's a good answer. Uh, I actually wrote an article about this that a few years ago, the Bitcoin community was consisting of some of the smartest people who are actually aware of the financial system and they saw what happened in 2008, 2009 when the banks collapsed. And they had all these ideals of turning Bitcoin into the next big financial instrument of the world. But we have seen in the last two or three years how all this spirit has vanished. And we have people who actually expect from the SEC to give an approval to the ETF for Bitcoin and open trading desks. And that's so much against the spirit and the ethos of the early Bitcoin adopters who actually wanted to distance themselves from the banks. And what, what do you think happened in the process? Do we have too many greedy investors like the Forex guys who just stepped in and wanted to make as much money as they could and they ended up holding bags? So, uh, first of all, I don't completely agree with you that the original narrative was especially against the banks. It was especially against uh, bailouts to banks, like uh, the typical, the, the, the Genesis Block uh, newspaper title was about the cancellor uh, on bridge of a second bailout of banks. So the problem is not that we have uh, this business called bank, which is a business uh, consisting of, of people, uh, on the market, uh, pro uh, proposing to other people to store their value for them or to, um, uh, or to invest their, uh, their wealth, uh, uh, giving out loans, so managing credit and debit uh, and matching the demand and supply of credit. So that's, that's not an evil thing itself. The problem with banks is that uh, just like many other uh, fields of, of the market, like, uh, uh, like um, the, the military, the self-defense, uh, or in many cases, the healthcare. It has been completely hijacked 
by uh, government monopolies that started to, uh, to use this monopoly in order to promote uh, uh, exclusions, uh, control, Orwellian sur surveillance, and uh, of course taxation in the form of inflation and manipulation in the form of, uh, uh, of uh, man management of interest rates. So uh, I think that the original narrative, even if probably we intercepted, with as a Bitcoin community, we did intercept some kind of anti-banks, uh, meaning anti-rich rhetoric. So like some kind of Occupy Wall Street rhetoric, like uh, you are a banker, you are rich, so you are evil. But the point was never uh, actually that you cannot have a guy managing credit. The point was that uh, the, the, the sector of credit and money uh, and banking in general has been completely hijacked by the government. So there are now rules that, uh, for example, if you try to donate to WikiLeaks, uh, the, the, the government uh, um, uh, convinced uh, or forced the banks to shut down your payment to WikiLeaks. Or uh, if you try to save your wealth uh, from inflation, the banks will uh, help the government to inflate using fractional reserve. Uh, or if you are trying to compete with, uh, with uh, uh, the government, like with uh, eGold, the banks will help the government to shut you down. If you, do, if you purchase goods and service, the banks will help the government to uh, track you down and spy on you and, uh, and eventually uh, punish you for your preferences. Uh, so, uh, and especially, the banks are betting financially. Uh, if they win, they get the profits. If they lose, they, uh, the government will take money from other people in order to bail out the losers. So they can never lose, and so that generates a lot of moral hazard, and so the banks are, are and the financial sector in general, they are getting even more and more uh, risky and unsustainable over time because of moral hazard created by bailouts. So Bitcoin was an antidote to that. Bitcoin, Bitcoin was a way to disintermediate banks directly because banks were corrupted by, by the violence of the state. Uh, the fact that uh, some bank could uh, maybe serve some, uh, some Bitcoin investor uh, and not Bitcoin user, but Bitcoin investor is actually not so bad. Uh, I don't think that the, the SEC um, uh, um, allowing a Bitcoin ETF or the Bitcoin future markets, they are not bad things per se. Bitcoin users, people that want to use Bitcoin to store wealth in an unconfiscatable way, they, they don't care about ETF. They will, they will get Bitcoin because an ETF can be confiscated while real Bitcoin cannot be confiscated. People who want to, again, donate to WikiLeaks or, do any, or move money out of China, they don't need a Bitcoin ETF because you cannot move a Bitcoin ETF out of China. You cannot use a Bitcoin ETF to donate to WikiLeaks. People who really need Bitcoin as a tool will use Bitcoin. But if somebody just wants to bet on the price of Bitcoin, that's, I think that's good for us because uh, uh, more demand for synthetic Bitcoin can anyway uh, um, bring up the price. And I mean, I don't expect an old legacy investor, the guy who is used to, to, to take up the phone, call his banks and say, let's buy uh, two, apples of sh uh, two shares of Apple, uh, three uh, barrels of oil and three Bitcoins. This guy will never become a cypherpunk uh, managing his own full node and his own private keys. He doesn't need it. This guy do not, does not need permissionless finance. He's okay with permissionless finance. He just wants to speculate on the price. So I, don't, I think there is nothing bad in uh, uh, permissionless finance uh, allowing people to speculate on Bitcoin price. That's, that's, I think that's okay. Uh, the problem is that people is expecting uh, the SEC or the other regulators to actually uh, give, a, 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 give a, a pass to all these uh, ICO uh, centralized and super easy, easy to censor, censor initiative. It's like, uh, so the government is telling you that you cannot issue um, securities without following some kind of stupid regulation which is very bad for financial exclu exclusion and everything. But the government is forcing you to follow this regulation. Now you create your centralized ICO or altcoin, and suddenly you, you hope 
that the government is not going to enforce the same regulation on, on you only because you pretend to use the buzzwords like blockchain or crypto, but you are still completely centralized, completely censorable, but you hope that the government will not crack you down. And that's a little bit, I don't know if, if this uh, fairy tale exists in every kind of uh, uh, culture. In Italy, we have it, uh, the three little peaks. So you have oh, yes. one peak that built, okay, you have it too. So you have this peak is building the, uh, his homes, uh, his home with uh, straw, the second one with wood, and the third one with bricks. So the third one takes a lot of time. Uh, it's like he's the boring pig. He will have to study architecture. He will have to spend a lot of energy and money and time uh, slowly building the brick house. Uh, the other, like the straw pig, the straw house pig, he will just do something quick, dirty, uh, super effective, and he will dance all the time mocking the brick house pig because he was faster and more effective uh, altcoins and ICOs token are like that. Bitcoin has been built in order to resist the regulator wolf uh, when it comes. So Bitcoin has been created in a way that when the wolf comes, uh, he cannot uh, bring the house down. Uh, while altcoins are just like the, 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 straw, uh, the straw house, uh, they have been built very quickly, very easily. You don't have all the hard things that you need in Bitcoin. So you can profit more and buy your Lamborghini. But when the wolf comes, they are, they are now like with, with Ethereum, they are now hoping to, uh, to keep the wolf uh, calm using lobbyism or, uh, or like uh, asking, please do not censor us, which is completely nonsense. You just gave me an idea for a little game that we can play. But if you don't want to, I'll just cut this from the final video. So I was thinking that I can read to you the names of the top 20 coins on CoinMarketCap. And you can tell me on a scale from 1 to 10 if there are scams or if they have some potential. Absolutely. I mean. Okay. So 1 means that it's very bad and 10 means that it has very high potential. So Ethereum. Uh, I would say two, uh, very, very bad, especially uh, because the thing with, that we call Ethereum now is actually the bailout version of Ethereum after the DAO, DA, DAO backup. So uh, I am I'm very, 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 very skeptical about Ethereum in general. So I would say two. Okay. XRP. Uh, I would say three. Because even if the uh, token itself is uh, even worse than an ether, is not even scarce, uh, they are controlling all the supply. At least the uh, the platform uh, Ripple itself, even if it, uh, it has been sold uh, uh, dishonestly as something else, it is like a new version of Swift. Banks can use a new version of Swift. There is just no use for X XRP token. Uh, so, uh, while the Ethereum infrastructure is completely useless, the uh, Ripple infrastructure is centralized, legacy, but may be useful. So, I will say three. Okay. Bitcoin Cash. Uh, that would be one because uh, uh, this is an explicit, unlike the others, this is an explicit attack on Bitcoin uh, generated by uh, a, 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 an entity that tried to take over Bitcoin, uh, Bitmain company, uh, and sold on a scam website that are trying to, uh, to basically to uh, defraud Bitcoin newcomers, trying to sell this altcoin, uh, calling it Bitcoin. So there is actually people, this is at the center of an attempt of defrauding people of a real, realistic fraud attempt. Also people associated, associated, the people most important uh, in the ecosystem of this altcoin are a, a con artist, uh, Craig Wright, a literal, uh, literal con artist. Uh, at this point, it's almost funny to see Craig Wright, so I, 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 no hard feelings toward him, but he is literally a con artist. Uh, the other ones are like uh, Roger Ver, the guy's coming, new buys, uh, selling an altcoin as Bitcoin, so a very dishonest guy. Uh, the other one is Jian Wu, the guy who tried to control and hijack Bitcoin and failed. Uh, so uh, after you see this, uh, yeah, one. Okay, EOS. Uh, okay, EOS. I will give it. Uh, so 
E EOS is bad because it's like the third scam in a row from, from uh, Daniel Larimer. First, he scammed people with BitShares, then he moved on to scam people with Steam, and then he moved on to scam people with EOS. Uh, but, so it, it's like a serial scam. Uh, but this is actually better. So I, I'm not sure of the numbers I'm giving, but in a way, uh, the fact that the, it's the third one, it's also, it also makes it like kind of honest. If you are so dumb to think that Danny Larimer is going to create something of value after the two scams in a row, uh, probably you deserve to be scammed. So uh, Larimer is just a professional. He does what he does. He scams people. Uh, at this point, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're getting wrecked, wrecked because you believe that EOS tokens can be the new Bitcoin, you probably deserve to get wrecked. Also, EOS architecture is completely, is mostly centralized. And unlike Ripple guys or Ethereum guys, they don't pretend to be more decent, much more decentralized than they are. So I will, get, I will give them four. Uh, it's, it's completely useless because everything you can do with EOS, eventually you, uh, you could do it with PayPal or similar or with just a Node.js central site. So it's probably useless. There is this federation thing that is mostly useless in my opinion, but they are trying less hard to pretend to be decentralized than Ripple or, or Ethereum. So four. Okay, Stellar. Stellar, Stellar uh, is still useless. So I can give it, uh, if uh, I cannot give it a six, which would be like a, a good enough uh, mark. Uh, let's say five. Uh, unlike um, unlike uh, EOS, uh, it is not uh, complete. Uh, it, it is not the production. Uh, the, it is not the product of a serial scammer. Uh, unlike uh, Ripple, they admitted the centralization. While one of the first explicit uh, the dif uh, differences between Stellar uh, and the, the original that Stellar fork, which was uh, uh, Ripple, was the, a more honest uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, their centralization. I don't think that you can use uh, Stellar to do anything that you couldn't do on a centralized uh, web server, but uh, it's, uh, at least you're not wasting time and money on fake mining like in Ethereum or in Bcash. Uh, so I will, I will give them five. I didn't like, there was a post of actually a very, very good service, which is Keybase. And that post was uh, pumping Stellar because Stellar gave a lot of money to the Keybase guys. And they were pumping Stellar with uh, FUD, with lies about Bitcoin, about Bitcoin energetic consumption and stuff like that. So I don't like the, I don't think the approach is completely honest, but I will give them a five. Mm, Litecoin. Okay, so uh, many of my friends, my maximalist friend do not agree with me about this, but I will give uh, Litecoin even a seven. Uh, Litecoin is useless as money. I don't think that you can use Litecoin instead of Bitcoin to do cheaper transaction. That doesn't make any sense because uh, uh, you have to assume that uh, you are storing uh, your wealth in sound money, so Bitcoin. And the other part is also storing his wealth in some money, so Bitcoin. So if you have to, you move Bitcoin from your core storage in order to buy Litecoin on a market, then transmit Litecoin, and then your counterparty has to sell Litecoin for Bitcoin on a market and, and transmit that Bitcoin in core storage, you're basically, instead of just having one on-chain Bitcoin transaction, you are having two on-chain Bitcoin transaction plus market fees plus Litecoin transaction. So the idea that you can use Litecoin to do, uh, is together with Bitcoin, to do fast and cheap transaction is bullshit. The promotion of Litecoin as uh, uh, silver to Bitcoin gold doesn't make any sense. The reason people use the physical silver together with the physical gold was because there was a trade-off between, uh, between transferability and divisibility because gold is very, very bad for division. You cannot buy bread with uh, uh, gold powder, so it cannot be divided, but it's very good to store your wealth in a compact way and to move your wealth because you can move all your wealth with very few gold coins. Silver, on the other hand, was very bad for storing wealth uh, and transporting wealth, but it was good for divisibility. 
so uh, people started to use both for a certain time because there was a trade-off. When people moved from physical gold to representative gold, banknotes, uh, basically, silver as money disappeared from the market because you don't need it anymore. Bitcoin is completely divisible. So being Bitcoin divisible uh, for a very, very good extent, you don't need silver to Bitcoin gold. So that said, uh, Litecoin was one of the first altcoins. Uh, and that's a good thing because uh, eventually, I can imagine, I don't know, in year 2030, well, altcoins are not promoted as real money alternatives anymore. But maybe some altcoin can survive as a collectible because it has some historical value. So I can think that maybe Namecoin and Linecoin, the very first uh, altcoins, maybe they could remain for historical value because they were the first scam coins. And uh, if, the, if the collectible value is enough to make some miner mine some Litecoins sometimes, like one block every few weeks, then maybe the network can survive as a collectible. Also, the people promoting Litecoin, they are not promoting Litecoin by uh, uh, attacking Bitcoin or lying about Bitcoin mostly, or, uh, de or uh, diminishing Bitcoin, or uh, they're not trying to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to put obstacles in the, uh, in the mission of Bitcoin in order to profit, mostly. Like Charlie Lee is a good guy. I don't agree when he says that uh, Bitcoin is silver, uh, Litecoin is silver to Bitcoin gold. I don't agree when he says that Litecoin is a side chain to Bitcoin. That doesn't make any sense at all. But they are not aggressively lying against Bitcoin. Uh, they are one of the first. So you give them the benefit of the doubt. And maybe it would be a collectible. And some people think that Litecoin is a, has a good value because uh, it was used as a bad test for Bitcoin. And that could be a good argument. If you think about that, there was some FUD about SegWit being dangerous because the miners could just take the money out of your SegWit address. And that FUD was debunked on Litecoin because Litecoin uh, basically uh, adopted SegWit before and nobody used SegWit in that way. So it was an empirical dismissal of that, uh, of that uh, concern. So yeah, Litecoin has been used as a testnet for Bitcoin. Uh, so let's give it seven, not as money, but as a future collectible of an ancient past. What about Tether? Should we discuss USDT or you think, think it makes should. sense? It does. And I will give it an eight. Uh, as long as the Tether company uh, can resist, uh, and it doesn't uh, get censored down or it doesn't explode or it doesn't uh, fail because of, I don't know, uh, uh, they, they are using a full reserve bank. But this full reserve bank, I don't think they are storing physical cash in their cabo. So probably they are storing in full reserve um, liability of the local central bank of that state. So there could be some kind of fractional reserve problem there. Also, there could be like a, a legal breakdown on Tether uh, because uh, uh, they are basically creating a service, a very useful service in order to avoid uh, KYC and AML restrictions. So you can buy uh, Tether from the company uh, applying to complete KYC and AML, but then you can move this Tether on the secondary market. Uh, it could be a good way to buy Bitcoin, for example, uh, from an exchange that cannot have a bank account. So it, it, Tether is a good strategy for uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage. It's probably not sustainable, but at least the, it's a centralized initiative, which uh, um, doesn't claim to be decentralized. So it's not like Ethereum or, or other stable coins. Uh, they, they admit what they are. And as, as, long, as, they, as long as they can exist without... Uh, the government taking them down, uh, they could be useful for, for traders or for buyers. So eight. Cardano. Cardano, I will give it, uh, let's, let's say um, a, a seven like Litecoin. I'm, I'm too good in this interview probably. I don't know why, but I, I wanted to express so much uh, opposition to the first one you named that I'm, I'm being a little, very good <laughs> with these ones. Cardano is a, a research project uh, with a lot of academic uh, uh, academic uh, um, effort 
Uh, I don't think it will never work in production. I don't think that proof of stake can work at scale in a secure way. I think there are logical problems with that. I think that the token Cardano was uh, sold, uh, uh, taking advantage of a crazy uh, bubble market. So many people will get wrecked with the other token. Uh, that said, uh, the, uh, the technological part uh, is, uh, I mean, there, there is less bullshit in the Cardano technological development that in the, for example, Ethereum 1. Uh, Charles Hosking is a little bit more serious about this stuff, I think, than people like Vitaly Buterin. So let's, maybe seven is too much. Let, let's give it six. Not too much. Five, sorry, sorry. Five, five. Cardano okay, five. so we settled to five. Yeah. What about Monero? Uh, Monero, I would give uh, a, a, um, probably a nine. It's probably the, uh, together with uh, Namecoin, uh, I, I would give probably an eight, just like Litecoin, also to see a coin and to name coin. Interesting experiment, doing something interesting. Uh, there was no point to create a new, new money to do that. Uh, they should do projects using the money which already exists, which is Bitcoin. But uh, at least the projects themselves are good and people working on those projects are not trying to antagonize uh, or to damage Bitcoin directly. They are not attacking Bitcoin. Uh, most of the people working on Monero or Namecoin or Siacoin are actually also active Bitcoin developers. So uh, I will give uh, uh, this uh, Namecoin, Siacoin a 7 and Monero an 8 because uh, other than being something similar to Siacoin, and the name coin in being a legit research experiment, uh, even if the coin part is scam, because you shouldn't create a new monetary base to launch your experiment. You can create a two-way packet sidechain of Bitcoin when that technology is ready. When that's not ready, you can just create a proof of burn. So people burn Bitcoin in order to, uh, to create this token. So it's one way, uh, at least you are not inflating the supply. Uh, and you are not scamming people uh, launching the new Bitcoin. Also, if you cannot do that, uh, a, a UTXO a drop like uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold, uh, that itself, I mean, Bitcoin Cash has a lot of scammy parts, but that thing itself is not scammy. It's better than creating a new altcoin. Then there is the, the new altcoin created from scratch, and then the worst possible thing is the pre-mine pre and the ICO. So this, this project, I would give them seven. Monero actually eight because uh, it has all the characteristics of these other projects that I mentioned, and maybe in the future green or, uh, or, or Chia. Uh, plus, people can actually use Monero in the real life with a use case right now. So I said before that it doesn't make sense to have Bitcoin, uh, move Bitcoin to a market, sell for Litecoin, transact to save on fees, and then the, the, the merchant buy back Bitcoin, but it could make some sense if you sell Bitcoin, uh, if you send Bitcoin to a market, sell it for Monero, send it uh, with, a, with a confidential transaction uh, with bulletproof and ring signature, and then the merchant will eventually change it back. Because maybe there are some configuration in which you are spending more uh, as of time and fees, but at least you are purchasing privacy. I'm not 100% sure that that these privacy features of, a th of a Monero are completely uh, sound because, for example, yes, you have uh, ring signatures and confidential transactions, but you also have smaller liquidity and so a smaller anonymity set. So there is less people using Monero. And so it's easier, even from a very, very obfuscated blockchain, to, uh, to analyze uh, behaviors with metadata and time linking and stuff then maybe it is on Bitcoin with a very, very clear text blockchain, but with a lot of users, so a lot of plausible deniability, especially with, uh, with things like uh, join market, uh, uh, coin join, uh, Tumblebit, or, or centralized mixers, and, or uh, the, all the samurai wallet the privacy uh, tricks, and so on. So uh, I'm not telling people to use Monero to be anonymous, because that could be actually counterproductive, but I know that some people, uh, taking responsibility for this are trying to use Monero as privacy coin, and that could make some sense. So let's give these guys uh, a eight. 
earlier you said that BitTorrent is actually a legitimate technology. And do you think that Tron has become a better project after it bought BitTorrent? Uh, well, Tron didn't buy the BitTorrent protocol. They bought uh, the BitTorrent company, which is just one random company creating a BitTorrent, uh, uh, a BitTorrent uh, uh, client. So uh, BitTorrent, the company, is not uh, BitTorrent the protocol more than bitcoin.com uh, is uh, bitcoin the protocol actually it's not that bad because at least the bittorrent company is giving you a client for bittorrent nor not for a scammy alternative while bitcoin.com is trying to sell you a scammy alternative but uh, you have to imagine that the name of the company doesn't mean that tron acquired the protocol they acquired the company w which did uh, which created uh, and 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 uh, sold uh, a, um, or distributed anyway, uh, a client for BitTorrent. Why? Probably just because of uh, marketing effort. I don't think there is something more serious around that. So no, I don't think that Tron is less scammy because they bought that company. So what's your grade for Tron? <laughs> uh, let's say three, because three? it's uh, three. Because it's um, as many as many central as many later uh, altcoins, they they didn't they actually didn't have time to uh, to try to promote and to uh, spread all the technical misconception and bullshit that uh, Ripple or Ethereum guys did try to uh, to, to to spread around. Uh, Tron is yeah. Uh, useless of course but uh, it, i think it made less damage uh, pe uh so let's put it this way people maybe both tron in order to make profit as a traders um some of them at the beginning uh, will some of them eventually will get wrecked it's okay it's betting basically it's gambling uh while there is people actually uh, companies actually convinced that the Ethereum blockchain makes any sense. And I think that's a, a, a wider and, and deeper damage than just some traders uh, buying the Tron token and selling it. So that's why a little bit more uh, open to, to, to that. What about IOTA? IOTA, uh, it's, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tool. Uh, it's like Ethereum. Uh, yeah. Maybe give, give, give those guys a tree. Uh, IOTA doesn't have anything to do with IoT. So they basically match it two buzzwords, the cryptocurrency buzzword with the IoT buzzword. But there is nothing in IOTA that makes any sense with IoT. Uh, they, they sold the token mostly uh, leveraging fake or ambiguous or overblown announcements like partnership with this and partnership with that. Uh, so that's, that's very, very scammy. Uh, they created, uh, they did something of the, they did the, the worst possible mistake you could do uh, trying to ship out their own uh, from scratch uh, newly made uh, cryptographic primitives, which is something you don't do, uh, and it was broken. And when people started to, to, to stay around that it was broken, they, uh, they reacted in a very, very uh, arrogant way. And that also there was some part of the code in which they claimed that there was like an anti-open source cloning feature. There was some mistake and the creators claimed that that mistake, that bug was put there intentionally in order to prevent people from uh, cloning uh, IOTA. So that's, uh, I mean, so much for the open source approach, putting intentional bugs in the source code. Uh, very, very trustless. So uh, it's bullshit. That's it. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the ideas of IOTA uh, are cool. Like, uh, uh, I don't think that realistically balanced ternary number systems and calculation and computing will take over the binary, but balanced ternary is cool. Uh, I like it. And also uh, uh, transaction, transaction graphs instead of blockchains uh, is something that has been studied in Bitcoin as well under the name of uh, Briding or uh, DAG coins and stuff like that since 2013 actually. There is a very, very good uh, presentation in Scaling Bitcoin by David, uh, David Vorick, the creator of SiaCoin, about braiding. Braiding is interesting as an experiment, as a concept, 
uh, it doesn't work in practice. Like uh, the, uh, in IOTA, it doesn't work. It works only because it's centralized and they have a coordinator. And if they get rid of the centralized coordinator, they will just, the, the graph will just diverge as it happened anyway. Uh, so it doesn't work. Uh, so it's scamming. But uh, I mean, at least they didn't do a bailout uh, to their friends like Ethereum guys did with the Ethereum bailout edition. So maybe better than Ethereum. Let's give them a treat. This is going to get so long, but I, I like it actually. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to split this in two parts just so it's easier to watch. But sure. le let's go on. What about Dash? Dash. Uh, Dash is a. Um, uh, let's give it. Uh, uh, well, let's give it a, a four. Something like uh, I would like this zone, like thrown of th things that are actually practically useless. They didn't shock me. They didn't shock me with uh, super scammy things like the Ethereum bailout or the IOTA uh, fake bug. So they didn't do anything explicitly scammy. Uh, I would. I mean. Maybe I give them a tree because uh, one of the things I hate uh, uh, when people is bullshitting about is privacy. Because if you're bullshitting about uh, uh, the price, people will buy it, then they will get wrecked, then they will complain, but uh, I mean, their fault. But when you are bullshitting about privacy, people could actually get, I, I don't want to say killed, but yeah, people could get killed if they, uh, try to use, for example, Zcash or Dash or any other fake privacy coin uh, in order to, for example, uh, avoid the, um, the surveillance of uh, a, 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 some kind of autocratic regime. So people could get serious consequences if they use a fake um, privacy coin. There is a, uh, I think that for people interested in understanding Dash a little bit better, there's a good comparison of privacy, privacy coins by uh, Aaron von Birdum uh, on, on Bitcoin Magazine. There is like a good comparison of Monero and, and Green and Zcash and Dash. So you can take a look at that. Uh, but uh, yeah, Dash will stay probably on three. Do you think Binance coin has any relevance whatsoever? It's just a metric which shows us, shows us that Binance is a successful exchange and they have managed to push a token which enables them to make cheaper transactions within their system. But do you think outside it that it has maybe any use or purpose? So this is a little bit like Tether, even if a little bit worse. Uh, but the point is, uh, I don't think that utility coin utility coins, utility tokens make any sense because uh, ut a utility cannot, um, cannot uh, uh, grow in value uh, in, most of, in most of the cases when the business itself grows in value. So to give you an example, let's assume you are creating a telephone company and before you launch the telecom, telephone, com telephone company, you uh, pre-sell on the market of our time represented by tokens. Uh, these are utility tokens. Uh, the problem is uh, it makes sense to use this token instead of Bitcoin because it's not money. You're not trying to recreate money. You are just representing our time. But if your business is of a telephone company is successful, the reason that one uh, minute of our time in your company should be evaluated by the market more. If anything, it will be evaluated less because you will be able to save cost uh, with, uh, and give discounts because of... Uh, uh, of uh, basically economies of scale. So utility tokens that don't make any sense as an investment uh, and they are promoted as an investment. Well, what is called security tokens, especially if they are okay, security tokens, they, they could be like tokens that give you a right to dividends or royalties from certain kind of business. So you get this token, when you get back, uh, basically you can claim uh, voting rights or loyalty, uh, royalties or, or dividends or stuff like that. Uh, there are two things here. The, 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 the bottom line is that this kind of thing is illegal because uh, securities are regulated in most markets by evil regulators that will want to, uh, to prevent you from doing what you want with your money and with your uh, other uh, pals and investors. So there is, a, there is a regulator trying to control security, uh, for example, to avoid uh, 
um, uh, beer instruments so they can enforce better uh, anti-money laundering laws in order to tax you better. Uh, everything disguised as uh, customer protection. So the government doesn't want you to trade uh, securities freely on the secondary market. So the point is, either you are using a Bitcoin-like technology to provide illegal securities, which are censorship resistant. So I'm, I'm Binance. I cannot just issue on my website a centralized security because they will shut me down. But magically, if I issue a token on the blockchain, I will be able to do some kind of regulatory arbitrage, just like Tether, in order to, I mean, maybe I tell the regulator, I will sell this security only to KYC people, but then since it's a, Bitcoin, it's a blockchain token, this security can be sold on the secondary market to anonymous uh, people uh, without any kind of regulation, without following any kind of regulation. So if that's the goal, uh, it makes any sense. Uh, I don't think that the Binance token is, uh, is, is really giving any guarantee of, uh, any strict guarantee of uh, returns from a security point of view. And I don't think it is engineer, engineered in a way that is particularly censorship resistant. If regulators want to shut down the Binance token as a security, they probably can. So uh, six, at least is not an attempt at replicating money. Just like Tether is not, uh, or, uh, or, uh, uh, or other kinds of, uh, uh, of token are not trying to recreate money. If you want to use money for your system, use Bitcoin. But if you want to represent something which is not money, but, but maybe they are rights to uh, some kind of, uh, of money nominated in Bitcoin. So if you're not trying to, not, to represent money, but a right to get some money depending on some parameters, maybe you could do a token to do that. So what do you think about NEO? It was one of the first coins which were promoted as the Ethereum killer and the Chinese Ethereum. And to some people, it looked promising because you could get some revenue from gas and it had some dApps, but do you think yeah. it's any good? No, I don't think so. Uh, maybe, yeah, don't, I would give it maybe a three instead of a two, just because it's not, uh, Ethereum is really, really, really scammy. Uh, Neo was like at the beginning, Neo as an open source repository on GitHub, and it was just a Bitcoin fork without any modification. So basically, the Ethereum kill, the Chinese Ethereum killer, was just a fork of Bitcoin without modifications for months, and people was already paying a lot of money to buy this token without anything. So it's a clear uh, pet.com style bubble, uh, which where people is paying for nothing because they think they, they're, they're, they're getting rich. And NEO is a typical situation like that. Uh, Chinese Ethereum killer, no, three. <laughs> okay. Ethereum Classic, you mentioned that it's maybe the better version of Ethereum or the original vision. I, I, I agree, I agree. And I would give it a, a, a four. So Ethereum is a collection of the worst idea that people were considering about Bitcoin back in 2012, 2013 like having computation on chain instead of just verification is a bad idea because it's not scalable and it lacks privacy completely. Uh, having a, a very, very fast block time uh, is a bad idea because it produces a lot of orphan rate and orphan rate uh, centralize, uh, the, centralizes the mining. So they introduce an uncle reward in order to, to compensate for that, but that's created an unpredictable uh, issue on schedule. So uh, issue, uh, having an unpredictable issue on schedule instead of just a fixed schedule is a bad idea. So basically every single bad idea discussed in Bitcoin or op eval, somebody was, was proposing for Bitcoin an op code that could parser and execute general code, but people just said this is nonsense because I mean, if you are, if you are producing the software for the cockpit of a plane, you don't want the, the software to be able to do everything. You want it, because, since it's a security critical application, you want the software of the co cockpit to be able to do exactly uh, a very, very well-defined set of things that maybe you can build on in complex ways, but the, the primitives should be uh, very, very easy to audit 
and to and to pre predict and and to uh, and to and to control. Uh, so Ethereum basically took all the bad ideas uh, out there and they launched them uh, as a product with a huge pre mine and which uh, with the, the with a huge ICO. Then they spent most of the money of the ICO in marketing. Uh, but then at least one of, I mean, at least the original Ethereum chain didn't explicitly change the rule, the rules of the system in order to bail out the financial losses of some insiders, including uh, Vitaly, Vitaly Buterin, uh, with something that people is forgetting that, that shit storm. But after the DAO, there was uh, actually this uh, white uh, hat uh, aching team that uh, that uh, that took the money on the uh, on the original uh, on the fork the chain and they tried to uh, sell it uh, on the market uh, uh, on Bitfinex in order to uh, to profit directly. Then then they got cow. It was a very very big scandal, but but people forget anything in this everything in this market. But uh, uh, so Ethereum as a concept is very bad in my opinion. Uh, but before the DAO fork, it was not incredibly scam. scam. After, After the DAO, DAO fell out, uh, I think it became very, very scam. So I will give Ethereum Classic. Also, I, I will give them even a five because they started to detach from, from Ethereum bailout edition because of the bailout, because it was a, absolutely the, the most stupid. Also a precedent for future censorship and future manipulation so it was a very very stupid idea but when they separated from ethereum because of that they started to to consider other things like they started to say maybe we should have a fixed supply or maybe we should not really have Turing completeness we should actually uh, have something more predictable or maybe we should there was uh, there, there were a lot of things like uh, uh, basically they were recreating bitcoin gradually they started to uh, to get closer and closer to the uh, to the Bitcoin original reasonable assumptions that were completely uh, distorted by the Ethereum experiment. So let's give those guys a five. The next one is Nem. Nem. Oh, so I I, I think that under this point the, the game is very nice, but under this point I think that I'm I'm losing any kind of serious distinction. So I would probably go on with uh, uh, they, they, they all sounds like Tron to me, like uh, nobody is seriously following the technology of NEM. So there is not a huge debate with uh, uh, engineers or developers fooled into thinking something because of NEM marketing, just like is the case for other uh, high market cap altcoins. NEM is just something that sums speculators and traders tried to make money out of so basically nam or tron or all the others altcoin from this point over are mostly just like uh, uh gambling on a roulette so they are going to disappear eventually uh, i'm quite confident that i i don't think that litecoin uh, will ever disappear i think that nam will probably disappear in less than two years if you if you look at the historical chart of uh, altcoins from 2013 uh, you see that there is a huge turnover these things come and then go and, and and disappear maybe they remain as a collectible in very very low liquidity markets like maybe in 2020 somebody will try to collect the all the uh, 200 most, most famous altcoins of the of the years 2013 2023 and so somebody will give some market praise to them but it's not going to be anything relevant at all in, in very very short time and i think that's uh, I, I will stop here just because i think that below this point i don't see a lot of uh, important distinctions Oh, okay, because I wanted to ask you about Tezos and Zcash, which are even more okay. delicate. No, no, let's, let's go there then. Tezos is a, well, uh, it's still a, a probably Tezor is, Tezos is a tree because they try to, it was not just a shitcoin for traders. They also try to represent some kind of um, uh, governance solution 
and then they started to fight with each other about governance and about the governance of money and they went to court in Switzerland. So uh, very, very funny. Uh, so let, let's say three. Uh, Zcash. Zcash, uh, so unlike Ethereum, uh, which is, uh, for my opinion, a very bad idea in general, uh, Zcash, like putting some cryptographical obfuscation in the blockchain in order to, uh, to, to have better privacy, like Monero does, uh, is an interesting idea. I don't say which, that is a, it's a good idea because you are trading basically more privacy in exchange for less scalability because uh, 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 cryptographically obfuscated transactions are l bigger and slower to produce and to verify and to broadcast and to transmit. Uh, so uh, you are giving up scalability, but you are getting some privacy, which is very important. And also you are giving up some security because uh, usually when you are doing cryptography, you, you have, uh, that's a very gener generic sentence, which is not super precise, but you have to, s to choose between uh, binding and hiding so you cannot have perfectly binding and perfectly hiding so when you are hiding stuff you could actually lose some security in in, in the binding binding and by so creating uh, inflation problems also in privacy coin if you have an inflation bug uh, detecting the inflation bug is tricky because it's a privacy coin so you are also having a trade-off between security and uh, and privacy uh, so the idea of using zk snarks to uh, to uh, to hide the, the 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 transactions in the public blockchain in the global consensus blockchain is not necessarily a very viable idea but it it's interesting um of course uh, the way that zcash was implemented was in my opinion terrible uh by in in many many point of view uh, for example first they did uh, uh, optional uh, privacy so you can choose a Z transaction or a T transaction and uh, the Z transaction is incredibly expensive to uh, to, to create and to sign uh, and to validate and so nobody is actually using Z transactions but since the marketing is all about uh, privacy coin you know Edward Snowden told everybody that Zcash is more private than Bitcoin so basically now you have hundreds and hundreds of people that is I mean you have the people just betting and gambling on the price and that's okay but you have people using the cash as it was private but everybody's using t transaction that means that if you want i mean liquidity and anonymity settings the cash is already uh, trivially small compared to bitcoin so probably even with zk snarks and z transaction you are easier to identify and to track on the cash than on than on bitcoin but then people using z transaction are such a small subset for obvious reason than the global, the global set of users that, that basically, if you use a Zcash transaction, you are basically alone with an anonymity set of a bunch of, of, of a few people. So there is no privacy at all in Zcash. That either if you are using the, the, the T transaction especially, but even the Z transaction because you have a small anonymity set. Uh, that was promoted uh, and over promoted about privacy in, 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 a, in, in a behavior, I think it's unresponsible. Then there was the security, the, the trusted setup with the people involved in this security circus with uh, Peter Todd going in the middle of the desert to do the trusted setup to check the, uh, the, 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 the entropy generation from, from the airplane, uh, crazy stuff the, like radioactive sources. And then the software, the, I mean, there is no guarantee that the things that the, these people actually run was the actual uh, uh, right image of the software. There is no guarantee that the, the stuff these people has been using during the trust setup was actually the, the one used to launch Zcash. So uh, you could have, a, a you basically create a huge security circus uh, to, to do some stuff, but the things you're giving them to, to do that stuff is not verified in the first place or verifiable. Uh, Peter Todd is still asking for the for some kind of proofs that uh, somebody should give him eventually. Then there is the trademark, like Zuko telling around that, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, like an open permissionless uh, uh, cryptocurrency, but if you use the, the Zcash uh, symbol, we are going to sue you. And that, that's, well, 
that's typically a decentralized uh, open source permission uh, system we, we can where there is a legal entity that's, that can sue you. But above all these, the fact that you even think to create a privacy cryptocurrency, privacy oriented cryptocurrency, anonymous cryptocurrency, using a centralized uh, um, US for profit company that screams on import. I mean, uh, eGold was shut down and their creator put in jail because they created some kind of alternative currency. Bitcoin was done this way, decentralized with Satoshi Nakamoto Anonymous, precisely because otherwise uh, Bitcoin creators would have put in jail just like eGold creators. So now these guys with face and name and surname are creating a coin like Bitcoin, but even more anonymous using and directing everything from a centralized uh, US company that's that's very very fishy and uh, and and then there was a very very ugly reward model instead of just mining they created the uh, the fee uh, like the developer fee embedded in the protocol what does happen if they lose the private keys so you have to update the protocol in order to change the address of the money i mean that's super ugly as a solution so uh so probably zcash is uh, uh I'm I'm undecided between two and three, just like Ethereum or a little bit better than Ethereum, but I I will go with two. I think you said four before, but after you presented all the arguments, it makes sense, I guess, to yeah. give it a two. Yeah, probably I I I basically pumped myself into into lower in the grade, so I started with four. But then I, I was a, I, I gave a very good speech and I convinced myself. <laughs> but would you say that Bitcoin is a ten? Uh, in this scale, yes. If we are, I mean, uh, if this scale is uh, about something that could work, but not, uh, we are using Bitcoin as a benchmark in this scale. Otherwise, if we are talking about money in general, uh, then. Uh, uh, then I will have to understand better the which kind of criteria we are using because, for example, uh, for adoption, the U.S. dollar is better than Bitcoin. Uh, for uh, uh, Lindy effect, physical gold is better than Bitcoin. Uh, but for uh, future outlook, right now, I think Bitcoin looks better than U.S. dollar, of course, and physical gold. Uh, so it, it really depends. It's more tricky if we, if we put all the kind of money together. So if we are just considering cryptocurrencies using bitcoin as a benchmark bitcoin is a 10 by definition okay this was incredible and i think i'm going to ask somebody from the news department to actually write down all this classification that you've made maybe use the less clickbaity headline so it doesn't sound like something sensationalist but you have made one of the most comprehensive and i didn't expect this Actually, I, I expected you to say, okay, Ethereum, that's a two. XRP, that's a three. Bitcoin Cash, that's a one. But you actually explained every details and you, you gave an argument for everything. And that's something which I really appreciate. And you took your time with it. And I just have two more questions and that's it. Because we have been talking for over an hour. And I have one from Twitter. And a guy named My Legacy Kit asks, does Giacomo believe that Bitcoin one day will cover all use cases in the extra pyramid? And if so, how? And how could it be avoided that spy agencies and other nefarious parties create private blockchains? And I'm not sure if you have an image of the extra pyramid. Yeah, 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 I do. So uh, first question, uh, very good question. I don't think Bitcoin is going to cover uh, all of these uh, use cases. I think that Bitcoin could uh, probably, if it succeed big way, if it really succeed in the uh, uh, hyper Bitcoinization scenario, I think that it could cover probably the, um, the gold market pretty well. Maybe not all because gold uh, could be like a, 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 an edge. It could be like a diversification against uh, uh, technological apocalypse. Uh, gold is something which is used as money since uh, uh, since the, the, the ancient times. So 
maybe it could take uh, in very optimistic view 80 percent of the market for investment gold of course not jewelry gold so investment gold yes it could probably uh, take most of that part uh, base money well yes especially if it's going to to to, to bring out of the business uh, the, uh, the the base money or central bank because of uh, uh, tier low uh, basically it could serve as money uh, instead of most of the base money, uh, so those uh, 28.8 million, so yes. Uh, bank money, this is trickier because yes, in a way, uh, if we have an economy based in Bitcoin, then uh, you can also uh, have people lending out Bitcoin even with a fractional reserve in theory, uh, but that's not very, uh, I mean, I think that much of uh, uh, this part of, uh, I, mean, I, I think much of this part of the pyramid has been created by the structure of the uh, uh, state controlled and state manipulated uh, money supply and uh, banking system. So if Bitcoin can displace the government control on money and on finance, I don't think that 50 trillion of uh, fractional reserve bank money uh, would exist anymore. So my answer would be no. I don't think that Bitcoin will take over this part because this part could basically, if not disappear, be being seriously reduced. Uh, it could be nominated. You can have uh, basically uh, fractional reserve nominated in Bitcoin, but it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it's easy. It's very hard for for bank clients to check the reserves of a bank. It's very easy uh, for uh, exchange clients. Uh, Nobody is doing that, but it's theoretically easy to check the proof of reserve cryptographically. Uh, so uh, that the same goes for government bonds. So uh, if Bitcoin succeeds, I think that the government bonds uh, part of the pyramid is going to be seriously reduced. So it's not that Bitcoin is going to take it over. It's, it's more that it's going to basically disappear uh, or, or be seriously reduced. Uh, so it's not that Bitcoin is really taking over all the pyramid, it's that it's taking over a part of the tier pyramid, making the other parts of the pyramid probably disappear. Then you have co uh, uh, corporate and municipal bonds, uh, let's, let's just say corporate, uh, which is uh, basically um, credits, uh, uh, credit. Uh, this could still ex exist and Bitcoin uh, can be used. I mean, you can in a post hyperconization world, you can use Bitcoin to 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 borrow uh, or to lend, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, wealth uh, should be counted inside the market cap of Bitcoin. Same with same goes with non-monetary commodities. I don't think that non-monetary commodities will uh, be uh, somehow. Uh, included in Bitcoin. Maybe the Bitcoin blockchain will serve as a platform to trade around crypto securities or crypto collectibles uh, or crypto derivatives, but I don't think that will enter the Bitcoin market cap itself. Uh, and then the derivatives. The derivatives, uh, just like the bank money or the government bonds, I think that the explosion of derivative markets, markets uh, is a Part, is in part a consequence of the manipulation of the economy by the government and bailouts and moral hazard and, uh, and uh, um, no skin in the game and externalities. So a Bitcoin world will probably make derivative explosion much more difficult because when you lose, you lose and the government cannot bail you out if the, the, if the government cannot tax people with inflation or uh, if uh, collecting money with normal taxation gets more difficult because of financial privacy. So for many, many reasons, it could get more difficult to bail out uh, failed banks. And that will probably redimension, uh, it will probably reduce uh, heavily uh, government uh, bonds, bank money with fractional reserve and uh, derivatives. So mm, my answer would be no. Second question. Uh, how could be avoided a spy agency or other nefarious parties create private blockchain? It cannot, but I, I, don't, I don't see what uh, a private blockchain could achieve. So let, let them, let's, let's just them play with private blockchains, but they cannot do anything with private blockchains. So uh, if you mean 
uh, how can you avoid that they are going to create something to compete with Bitcoin? Uh, they can, because if they want to compete with uh, hard uh, and dark money, which is Bitcoin, so money that can be uh, that cannot be inflated or manipulated as a supply and that cannot be easily censored or spied upon, um, then uh, you have to create something like Bitcoin. And so we just stay with Bitcoin. Uh, and if you want to create something different from Bitcoin, for example, manipulated uh, or easy to censor, then you are not competing with Bitcoin. So uh, I don't really see um, any problem. Let, let them play with uh, private blockchain. I think that uh, right now already private blockchain are, are perceived like a joke by many, many people in, in the fintech industry. Uh, it was a buzzword until last year. Now people is understanding that it's mostly a joke. So yeah. Let's build private blockchains, not a problem. I feel sorry that this is the last topic that we discussed because it should have been earlier in the interview. But I really liked your presentation with the B Foundation, even though it's not supposed to be called a foundation and it's going to be the B. And I had an interview with Jameson Lop. And he had very kind words to say about your involvement in Europe. And he said that he wanted to do the same in the United States, but didn't have the same legislative background to work with. And what do you have to say about this project? Do you think that it will grow in time? Do you think that the next generation of blockchain developers will actually get educated through the B? Do you think that at, at one point you will actually lobby for Bitcoin in countries or are you trying to stay away as a purpose? So we will stay away on purpose from lobbying. That was not the... Um, so I appreciate that you liked the presentation. Many people in Riga liked it, but many people abroad, just like a little bit like the maximalist presentation, uh, the partial information was uh, probably very easy to, uh, to uh, misunderstand. So uh, many people didn't, uh, didn't perceive the, again, the iron sarcasm in some of the choices of the name and some of the slides. And so they, went, they, they started to assume that we were going to create something like uh, uh, to represent officially Bitcoin, which is not the case, or to lobby for Bitcoin with governments, which is not the case. What we want to create is basically a platform exchange uh, to, to match demand and offer for uh, open source development donation. That's all, that's all I've done for the last three years. Uh, I mean, uh, outside my for-profit job. For profit, I was consulting and teaching and, uh, and uh, no pro non-profit, I was basically donating to Bitcoin projects, uh, no string attached. Uh, so uh, hopefully the, the B will, will continue what I've done for three years with a bigger, uh, with a bigger set of uh, people, with a bigger reach, with a more sound legal structure that Alena Vranova um, uh, thought about. Uh, so I'm super happy that, uh, that Jameson uh, could also be part of it. Mainly, I think I will, uh, in a good way, use Jameson mostly as uh, what we call a reviewer. So the idea of the B is that uh, there will be a hierarchical tree of projects and they will, they will be donors donating to some node of, it, of the tree, and there will, they will be developers uh, claiming the donation like a bounty because of some development work that, work that they did. So the, we need people in order to, uh, to uh, uh, the donor itself, mostly, at least in my experience, it doesn't want to directly uh, project manage, uh, manage a project or to directly assess the code, test the code, and decide they, they want to donate. Mostly they are not, uh, often they are not even technical people. So we need people that can uh, get the money in operating as an escrow. And then uh, when the, 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 the developer is submitting some proposal, they can evaluate the proposal and release the bounty or not, or ask for modification. Uh, James Lop will be one of these uh, guys in, in my uh, expectations. And he, so far he accepted. There was a lot of, uh, misconceptions about the role of the famous people I called on stage. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, we will have like uh, everybody in the same company centralizing uh, Blockstream um, and the Casa Hotel or stuff like that. Uh, everybody will keep their normal job, 
Jameson, we work for Casa Hodel, which is a very cool company, by the way. Alena, we work on Casa Hodel as well. I will work on my for-profit business. Uh, Adam Beck, we work on Blockstream. Uh, everybody there, we work on their project. And, uh, but they will also be uh, somehow uh, requested to evaluate, uh, project, uh, evaluate uh, uh, bounty claims inside the B website. So uh, I, I had the occasion, um, the announcement created a lot of curiosity. So I discussed the B with a lot of people also in interviews and podcasts. So I started to feel a bit uncomfortable because I'm talking a lot and I'm not delivering anything yet. So I will, I will feel much more comfortable to talk about the B when we finally have the legal entity in Lake Testain incorporated and the software of the donation flow uh, out, uh, up and running. Uh, I look forward for that. I hope we can do that before November, uh, but I'm not committing myself because uh, these things are always a bit unpredictable. And uh, when we start to see the first donation flows, I think it will be clear to any, any, everybody what the hell we are doing with the B. Not lobbying, not representing Bitcoin, uh, um, going out to fund development efforts and uh, uh, some effort in marketing to uh, debunk uh, myths and misconceptions and lies, which is basically what I've tried to do during this interview as well. That's great. And I'm happy that we had this interview. And grazie, Giacomo. <laughs> <laughs> Prego, ottimo italiano. O parlo un po' di italiano. <laughs> Perfetto. You wrote for Crypto Insider uh, a few months ago. Uh, just once, unfortunately, I wanted to more often, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good at giving talks because I just talk a lot, as mm -hmm. you have seen. Uh, but uh, when I have to write, I, I rewrite every sentence uh, 100 times, so I'm so slow and perfectionist. And so I, I wrote something which I think was a good article about the UASF uh, and, uh, and all this stuff. Uh, I like the article that uh, came out of, of that, but I promised to Crypto Insider a lot of other articles that I never delivered. So hopefully I will start writing again, but I'm so slow at writing. I will need like a ghostwriter uh, recording me talking all the time and writing it down. It's okay because this interview will be transcribed. So everything that you said will appear in text. You can get it. You can use it for articles. Do whatever you want with it. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So have a great rest of your day and thank you for this interview. Have a great day too. And thank you. Bye.